You are listening to The Gateway Church, located in Ferrisburg, Michigan. You can learn more about us by visiting thegateway.church or like and follow us on Facebook, where you can watch full services, keep up with all that is going on, and get connected. Well, in this season, it's been definitely we've been disrupted, and we've been in a series called Disruption. And when we were thinking about Father's Day in particular, uh, we thought, you know what, we're on, we're going to be online, and, uh, and we thought, man, uh, let's shoot for the moon in regards to a Father's Day speaker. And we started talking about it as a staff, and we even talked about it as a board, and we were saying, man, who would we want to join us on a Sunday to address our people, to be with us at the Gateway Church? We knew it was going to be virtual, and we said, you know what, let's go for someone that there's no way we probably uh, could afford or to even uh, to consider uh, to come. And we narrowed it down to two individuals. We said either Bob Goff or Robert Madu. And uh, I did call Bob Goff, you know, his phone number is in the back of his books, and uh, never got through. But Robert Madu, we had a connection through another pastor in Grand Rapids that helped us make a connection with Robert Madu. And you're saying, well, who's Robert Madu? Well, Robert Madu in the uh, Christian circles, he is a world-renowned speaker. He's a pastor, he's an evangelist, and uh, he has uh, spoke at uh, some of the largest churches in America and across the world. And uh, he had spoke uh, this last year at our general council for the Assemblies of God. And I'm telling you, Robert Madu is uh, a world-class guy. He is phenomenal, and you're going to absolutely love him. And, and so we reached out to Robert Madu. We said, hey, would you record a service for Father's Day just for us at the Gateway Church? And he was willing to do so, and he's done so. And so we're going to, uh, without further ado, I'm going to encourage you to just tune in, stick with us. Uh, Robert Madu is going to bless your socks off. And for those that are here, those that are online, uh, you're going to absolutely love Robert Madu. And without further ado, here is our main man, Robert Madu. Going to- Good morning, Pastor Robert Madu here. Hey, you know me, I am incredibly excited and elated to be at the Gateway Church. Thank God for the gift of technology that allows me to be with you on this incredible Father's Day. We're celebrating all the dads. Here's what I want to do, even right now. I want all the dads, would you just stand to your feet? Come on, all the dads stand up. And before we do anything, can we celebrate these mighty men of God? Come on, the Gateway Church. Would you help me celebrate them? Awesome. You may be seated. Dads, we salute you. It is good to be with you. I bring you greetings from the great country of Texas. And uh, it's awesome to be there in Michigan uh, with you via technology. I want to stop and really thank God for the pastor for your church, who I've had the privilege to have conversations with, and is just the most genuine man. And if you love your pastor, why don't you just make some noise for him? Love you, Pastor Ben. Thank you so much for letting me speak on this Father's Day weekend. I'm excited to share a message, uh, not just to the fathers, but especially to all the men who are gathered there uh, today. And I have an awesome word for you, and I want to jump straight into it. Now, I know I've never been to the Gateway before, uh, but I'll let you know right now, you got to get involved in my preaching, okay? I know I'm on the screen, but if you hear anything that is resonating with you, you can say amen, say preach that. Uh, just don't sit there quiet. I want you to engage in the service today. And I want to look at a passage in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. And then we'll also look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. This is a moment in the life of Jesus. And man, I just believe that Jesus is our model. He is our measuring stick for manhood and for what it is to be a father. And I want to look at this passage because it's going to give us strength and courage especially for how we live in this current day and age that we are in. So look at Matthew chapter 3. We'll start at verse number 13. And it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. 
Then he allowed it. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved son. I hope every father can hear that today. Hear your heavenly father declaring over you, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Mm, that's good stuff. Go to Matthew chapter 4. We're just going to look at verses 1 and 2. Matthew 4 verses 1 and 2. And it says, then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. I want to talk to you today on this Father's Day from this title, A Man in the Wilderness. Maybe you're a man watching today, a father watching, you're like, I feel like I'm in the middle of a wilderness. We're going to learn from Jesus, what does a man do when he's in a wilderness. And I know in our studio here today in Dallas, it looks like I'm in the wilderness with these trees around me. But I believe this is really going to give you some handlebars of what to do as a man in the wilderness. Would you bow your heads with me? Gateway family, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Speak to our hearts today. Lord, I thank you that we can say our father. You're our father, no matter who we are or where we've come from. Lord, I pray you would speak to our hearts, especially to every man who has an ear to hear what you're saying. Let us truly be transformed by your word today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, oh, come on, everybody said, amen. If I was there at the Gateway Church in person, I promise you I would probably be there with my father, my Nigerian father. His name is Robert Madu Sr. And my father and I, we have the exact same name but totally different vocations, completely different vocations. My father, uh, he just recently retired from being a fireman for the city of Dallas after serving for 34 years. Come on, let's just stop right there and shout out all of our essential workers and all of our firemen and firewomen. I mean, he was a phenomenal firefighter. So we got the same name, but completely different callings. I think that's important for you to note because I'm a preacher. He's a fireman. That's important for you to note because in the unlikely event that your house was to catch on fire and you were to be trapped inside of that house that caught on fire. And for whatever reason, you could only call one Robert Madu to get you out. <laughs> hey, make sure you call the right Robert. OK, make sure you call the right Robert. Now, don't get me wrong. Both of us will do our best to make sure you get saved. Like, like neither one of us would want you to experience the flames. However, how we accomplish that will be totally different. My father, who's the fireman, he is a superhero. He's going to jump on that fire truck, go inside the house, and rescue you from the flames. My approach will be completely different. I'm going to stand outside of the house, a, a good distance away from you, and I'm just going to grab a microphone. Yes, and I'm going to encourage you, and I'm going to say something like, oh, consider it pure joy whenever you face fiery trials, knowing that the Lord is with you. If he helps Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he can help you too. I'm telling you, that's what I'm going to do because I am not a firefighter. I am a preacher. And to be honest, on a more serious note, some of my greatest memories as a kid was when I would visit my dad at the fire station. You got to understand, when you're a kid, a fireman, you get to visit him at the fire station. People, the fire station to a little boy is like Disney without the ticket prices, okay? It's Legoland without the lines. I vividly remember as a kid running around the fire station and trying on the uniform and uh, climbing the ladder. I remember pretend driving the fire truck. I remember kids at school would be like, Hey, Robert, I, I got a new uh, truck for Christmas. I'm like, that's cool. I drive fire trucks. Hashtag dream bigger. I mean, it was awesome moments that I'll never forget. But hear me, the Gateway family, I will never forget the day I'm a kid. I'm visiting my dad at the fire station. I'm pretend driving the fire truck. And all of a sudden, without warning, I hear on the intercom, engine 26, five alarm house fire. Engine 26, five alarm house fire. And all of a sudden, my father, 
went from laughing and smiling and me pretend driving a fire truck to all of a sudden in his Nigerian voice saying, son, get up now. He picks me up, throws me out of the seat to my mom. Immediately, firemen started coming out of the crevices in the corridors of the fire station like ants escaping an ant bed that had just been stepped on. I saw two firemen who were playing ping pong. They threw the paddles in the air and started putting on their gear eating a turkey sandwich. He stopped mid-bite of the turkey sandwich and jumped on the fire truck and in no less than three minutes, the same fire truck I was pretend driving was now peeling out of the parking lot and the same siren I was pushing for my entertainment was now being pushed for an emergency because time was of the essence and destinies were on the line and I will never forget the look in my father's face and the immediacy of the moment as he had to quickly transition from a moment of fellowship with his son to now racing to put out a fire that he didn't even start. Church family, I share that illustration with you today to articulate the tension that is happening in the life of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3 and in Matthew chapter 4. Because in Matthew chapter 3, with Jesus' baptism, he's experiencing an open heaven, the glory of God. And in chapter 4, with his temptation, he is racing to put out a fire that he did not start, but was started in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve were disobedient and brought sin into the world through their disobedience. And the tension is in Jesus' transition from Matthew chapter 3 to Matthew chapter 4. Now stick with me, especially all you men. I'm going somewhere with this because I think one of the challenges we face in our Bible reading is that although the chapter numbers and the chapter verses in the Bible can be helpful, sometimes they can actually be a hindrance and stop you from getting the context of the text that you're reading. So if you're not careful, you do what I've done for years, which is to read about Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3, then pause for commercial break, and then read about his temptation in Matthew chapter 4, and you'll be tempted to look at these two events as isolated events that should be viewed independently. But I'm telling you today that these two events were never supposed to be viewed independently, but rather interdependently, because God has given us men, us believers, biblical blues clues as to what happens and what you will face in this walk with God. Come on, look at our world today. It will not be easy. There are challenges, and it is what happens with you as a man in the water that gives you the fortitude to face what is going to confront you in the wilderness. Hear me, you cannot face the wilderness as a man until you have a moment in the water where your heavenly father has declared who you are and whose you are, but the water and the wilderness are deeply connected. The only way you can be a man and handle the wilderness is to be a man who's had an experience in the water that the water and the wilderness experience is connected. I love the way Mark puts it in his gospel, uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. Let's look at it together. It says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Look at verse 11, verse 12 rather. It says immediately, immediately, no pause, no chapter break, immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beast. Immediately he goes from being a man in the water to a man in the wilderness, immediately. And it's really that immediately that kind of irritated me because I'm trying to figure out how in the world one moment he's in a battle or excuse me, one moment he's in baptism, the next moment he's in the middle of a battle. One moment he's in the water getting a word from heaven, the next moment he is facing real warfare. Come on, one moment he's hearing a voice from heaven, the very next moment he's hearing a voice from hell. Come on, don't act like you've never been there before. Come on, didn't 2020 start off kind of good? You're like, whoo, this is going to be my year. I might get a raise this year. Who I'm going to be the man God has called me to be. And all of a sudden, after the water, here we are hit with the wilderness, the wilderness of a global pandemic, 
the wilderness of economic calamity, the wilderness of racial injustice, the wilderness of pain and sickness and disease. Right after the water comes the wilderness. What do you do? The man in the wilderness. Why is it on the pathway to your purpose? Hear me, man, en route to your destiny that the GPS system often says, start on water road, then make a sharp right turn into the wilderness. The tension is always in the transition. Before I talk about being a man in the wilderness, let's first start with being a man in the water and what happened with it. Understand that Jesus' baptism was a big deal. Come on, how many know if it, it was a big deal? In fact, if you put your faith in Jesus and you haven't gotten baptized yet, come on, what's wrong with you? Get baptized. You've got to get baptized. If Jesus got baptized, you know your crazy self needs to get baptized. Jesus' baptism was a big moment. It was an epic moment. I know it was a big moment because the Bible says that the heavens opened up when Jesus got baptized. The heavens opened up. Come on, you know when the heavens open up that the atmosphere has just shifted. You know when the heavens open up, your life is never going to be the same again. Come on, I know his baptism was a big deal simply because of what the Father was declaring over Jesus. He was not declaring random words. He was declaring something, hear me, that's got to be the anchor in every believer and especially every man's soul. He's got. He was declaring a truth that you have got to hold on to no matter what you're facing today and that truth is this. I am loved. I'm a child of God and he he is pleased with me. Hear me, man. You got to know that you are loved. You're a child of God and he is pleased with you. Hear me, fathers. You got to know that you are loved. You're a child of God and he is pleased with you. Come on. I know I'm on the screen and some of y'all might be checking out. So I want to re-engage you real quick. I want to interrupt this regularly scheduled sermon so you can engage in a verbal exercise. Come on all the way there in Michigan. I want you to say this, say this. I am loved. I'm a child of God, and he is pleased with me. Oh, come on. I think you can do a little bit louder. Let's try it again. Say, I am loved. I'm a child of God, and he is pleased with me. I'm telling you, when that gets in your heart, when that gets anchored in your spirit, I'm telling you, that'll change the way a man walks into the room. Fathers, that'll change the way you hold up your head to know that you are loved. You're a child of God, and He is pleased with you. I've had my heart broken and been so heavy seeing all of the racial injustice, and it's weighed heavy on my heart. I've had to remind myself in those dark moments, I am loved. I'm a child of God, and He is pleased please with me. That truth right there will change your life forever. As a matter of fact, I want to give you a dare. Every morning you wake up, before you brush your teeth, just go to the mirror and declare over yourself with your stanky breath, I am loved. I'm a child of God and he is pleased with me. If you could get that anchored in your soul, you wouldn't need so much validity from other people when you know the heavenly father. See, this had to happen in Jesus' life. He needed this open heaven moment where his father declared over him he was loved, he was his child, and he was pleased with him because that was going to give him the fortitude to face the wilderness in front of him. Come on, I want somebody that's watching today, maybe you didn't have an earthly father, but you need to lean into your heavenly father. And what he declares over you is that you're loved, you're his child, and he is pleased with you. Whew, I'm telling you, this is blessing me. I might rewind this and watch it later. That truth will change your life in the water. Problem is, that is where a lot of believers stop. A lot of men, we stop at the water experience. And don't get me wrong, the water experience is important. Oh, the water experience is imperative because that's where you find out, hear me, where your identity is. Yeah, the water is a place where you find out who you are and who. I want you to note, man, when the father made this declaration over Jesus, this is before he's healed the sick. He hasn't raised the dead yet. He hasn't taken the two fish and five loaves and multiplied it. He hadn't done any of that. He hadn't been to the cross yet, hasn't walked on water. And yet the father still says, you're loved, you're my child, and I'm pleased with you. How? He hasn't done anything yet. Exactly. 
because your acceptance by the Father has nothing to do with your performance, but everything to do with your proximity, where you are in relationship to Him. I'm telling you, when you know you are loved, you're a child of God, and He is pleased with you, you can stop trying to perform, you can stop trying to get validation from other people, because you already know it comes from your father. And that happens in the water. And the water is an awesome moment. But I felt the need to warn some men today. Oh, that right after the water, you will have to be a man in the wilderness. Right after you experience sometimes the most incredible moments, we walk straight into the wilderness. I wish it wasn't this way. Oh, I wish it wasn't this way. In fact, when I was studying this text, I said, God, hold on. I don't want to have to be a man in the wilderness. I don't want to go from the water experience to the wilderness. I told God, if I can pick it, give me my water experience in the wilderness. Oh, yeah, this is how I talk to God. I said, give me the water experience in the wilderness. If I can pick it, that's where I'd like to have it. Maybe I got too much imagination, but I feel like this text would have read a whole lot better if it started off in the wilderness. Come on, can you see it? in the wilderness, and all of a sudden, Satan comes to Jesus and says, if you are the Son of God, all of a sudden, then a voice comes from heaven and interrupts Satan in the middle of him talking and goes, what do you mean, if he is the Son of God? He is the Son of God because I already said he was the Son of God. Satan, I'm going to tell you right now, you better respect that man, Jesus. Yes, he's not just a good man. He is a God man. You better respect it. If you don't respect him, I'm about to mess you up. As a matter of fact, let there be water. And then water shows up in the wilderness. And the whole Godhead takes Satan by the throat and just starts drowning him in the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after Satan's lifeless body is floating in the water, Come on, that's when you call John the Baptist and say, uh, we're ready for the baptism now. Come on, I, I think the text would have read a whole lot better like that, but it will not happen. Because as a man, you will not be void of challenges, of controversy, of trials. God wants to see how will you stand in the wilderness. And the only way you're going to make it as a man, as a mom, as a believer in the wilderness is to remember what he spoke over you in the water. Can I tell you, this is what messes up a lot of believers, especially today, because it's almost like we've been trained and programmed to think that if I truly have heaven's approval, that means I won't have any frustrations in life. That means I won't go through suffering. Not in your Bible. Hear me, the Bible and God never promises you a life without suffering. What he does promise you is that he will be with you in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of the pain. But it did not promise you a life without suffering or without a wilderness. That is not in your Bible. As a matter of fact, we tend to think that if I have the approval of heaven, that means everything in my life is going to be perfect. I'm going to float in the room. Kool-Aid is going to come out of the water fountain and Worship music is going to play 24-7. No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, I would dare say that it is often the greater the approval of heaven on your life, the attack from the enemy. Oh, yeah, it, it is the smile of heaven that attracts the scowl from hell. I'm going to say that again. It is the smile of heaven that attracts the scowl from hell. And I'm telling every man, every father, every believer who's watching right there at the Gateway Church to receive the smile from heaven. Receive it. Relish in it. But don't get shocked when you get the scowl from hell. Because it is what you experience in the water that gives you the fortitude to face the wilderness that's in front of you. It is always the transition from the water to the wilderness. Come on, in this text today, John the Baptist, he's baptizing people in the water. He's baptizing in the water. But when they asked John who he was, he said, I'm a voice crying out in the it's because it's always about the water and the wilderness, the water and the wilderness. As a matter of fact, if the water is the place where my identity is confirmed and I find out who I am, now I know why the children of Israel had to go through the Red Sea. Yeah, because the Red Sea was water. And it was in the water that their identity needed to be confirmed because Pharaoh thought they were just slaves, but they were more than slaves. How many know they were God's chosen people? They were loved. They were children of God and he was pleased with them. And when you are God, 
stronghold. Hear me, man. There is no addiction. There is no bondage that can ever hold you down because whoever the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. And they went, watch this, not from the water to the promised land. They went from the water into the wilderness. They were in the wilderness 40 years. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days. And God always has this system of giving you water moments that are often followed by wilderness moments. He always takes you from the water to the wilderness. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I would even argue that the way we enter the world is just a picture. It's just a microcosm of this transcendent truth that God always takes you from a water moment to the wilderness. Oh yeah, my wife and I, we got three little humans, five, four, and two. Pray for us. So I remember when they were born, I'm telling you, isn't that how we enter the world from the water to the wilderness? You remember how you were conceived? Come on, you do remember how you were conceived, right? You were conceived in your mother's womb. Identity confirmed in the womb. Whoop, we're having a boy. Oh, we're having a girl. And isn't it funny, in your mother's womb, you were surrounded by water. Yes, water. Surrounded by water. So much so that when your head got too big and your birth was imminent, your mama looked up over the dining room table and said, uh-oh, my water just broke and rushed hospital. And do you remember your first birthday? Do you remember how you entered the world? Come on, did you enter the world laughing? No. Did you enter the world singing? No. Did you enter the world dancing? No. Laughing? No. You entered the world just like this. Ha! Ah! Ha ah! ha! Screaming at the top of your little lungs. And then us newborn rookie parents have the nerve to look at a newborn going, oh, welcome to the world. And they look at us and go, ah, screaming. Oh, and if I could translate the cry of every newborn baby, I think the caption underneath the screen would read, what do you mean, welcome to the world? Don't you mean welcome to the wilderness? You spend all of your days wrestling with the complexities and the frustrations of the wilderness that you were born into. See, this is why the church, especially in this era and this season that we're living in, has got to be quick to love people, quick to have empathy, quick to feel people's pain, because you don't know the wilderness that some people were born into. Be careful judging people until you have felt the wilderness that they had to walk through until you felt their pain. That's the problem with what we're seeing in the earth right now is that people will not hear each other's pain when they're telling you, I have been in a wilderness. We've got to be people who understand people who've gone through the wilderness. The wilderness can be a dark place. The wilderness can make you wonder, who am I? The wilderness can bring you down to your knees. But if you can hold on to what God speaks in the water, you can face whatever wilderness that's in front of you. It's interesting that the enemy was already in the wilderness waiting on Jesus to get there. That's what he was doing. He was waiting, watching him to get there. And it's interesting that the Bible says that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Oh, don't miss this. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. So if the Spirit led him into the wilderness, that means the wilderness is not my real problem. See, a lot of people say, oh, I want to be Spirit led. Be careful when you say that. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. The same Spirit that descended upon Jesus in the water was the same Spirit that led him into the wilderness. The Spirit led him there. So that means the wilderness is not the problem. It was Satan, the enemy who was in the wilderness waiting for him to get there. And every man you need to know from the day you were born, there was a target put on your forehead. The enemy hates a man of God that will stand up in his call, stand up in his purpose, stand up for his family. That's why he's been watching, waiting, trying to destroy you. He did it with Jesus. Please believe he's going to do it with you. But I want to give you some tools of how you fight the enemy in the wilderness. Are you ready? I'm almost done. But every man, I want you to write this down. Number one, these are your tools. If you're going to be a man in the wilderness. Number one, you got to know where you are. You got to know where you are. What season of life is this for you? Notice Jesus was at the beginning of his ministry and right at the beginning, 
here comes the battle. Some of you have wondered why it's been such an attack on your life for so long, because the enemy was trying to stop you before you ever got started. Come on, he was always attacking Jesus, but there was moments where the attack was more intense. He did it at the beginning. He did it again on the cross. At the very end, he did it through a voice in the crowd who said he saved others. How come he can't save himself? Trying to get Jesus to abort his mission because he was right on the edge of bringing our redemption. Sometimes it's when you're right on the edge of your breakthrough, hear me, man, that the enemy will attack you the most. You got to know where you are. What season of life is this for you? Number two, you're going to be a man in the wilderness and face the attack of the enemy. You got to know that the word of God is your weapon. Oh, come on. I could have church right there. Let me get a good amen in Michigan on that point. The word of God is your weapon. With every temptation, what was Jesus' response? It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. Not it is hashtag. Not it is tweeted. Not it's in a sermon that I heard Pastor John preach. No, it is written. The word of God is your weapon. I find it intriguing that when Jesus was a man in the water, the word came over him. But when he was a man in the wilderness, the word came out of him. Ooh, see, we get it twisted. When we're in the wilderness, when we're going through it, what do we want? We want a word over us. Uh, and then we want a word over us. But I'm telling you, when you're in the fight of your life, you need more than a word over you. You better have some word coming out of you. And it can't come out if you've never taken the time to put it in. Hear me. This is a season, especially right now, to get the word of God in you. It is your only weapon against the enemy. Number three, you're going to win the war in the wilderness and be a man in the wilderness. You got to know what is at stake. What is at stake? The reason Jesus did not give in to the enemy is because he knew that the hope of humanity, our salvation was at stake. Jesus, hear this, made decision with our destiny in mind. He knew that the first man, Adam, had already made a mistake in the garden and given in to sin. He, as the second man, Adam, could not make that mistake. The first man, Adam, chose to die with his bride. The second man, Adam, chose to die for his bride. He knew that the hope of humanity was at stake. And when I tell you as a man, when you're facing temptation, please remember what is at stake. There's somebody watching you. There's a family that's dependent on you. There are people that are looking up to you, remember what is at stake when the enemy's attacking you in the wilderness. Number four, you're going to win the war in the wilderness and be a man in the wilderness. You got to know where your help comes from. You got to know where your help comes from. Come on, I know you're a manly man. You know how us men do. We'll carry 25 bags of groceries on two different hands, say, oh, I'm good. I got it. I got it. It's a dying man's last word. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. But I find it intriguing that after Jesus resisted every temptation, the Bible says angels came and ministered to Jesus. Angels came and strengthened Jesus because he was fully God and fully man. And he needed strength in his humanity. Can I tell you, you don't have to fight the battle alone, Dad. You don't have to be the husband he's called you to be in your own strength. By the way, you can't be the husband he's called you to be in your own strength. You can't be the father he's called you to be in your own strength. You can't lead that business like you're supposed to in your own strength. But thanks be unto God that we know where our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord. I'm thankful that his strength, as Paul said, is made perfect in our weakness. But you got to know where your help comes from. And you got to know when to cry out to him and say, God, I need your help. I'm so thankful for this opportunity to preach and share this word, especially on this Father's Day. And I want to speak to some man who would be honest enough in this moment to say, you know what? I'm in a wilderness and I need supernatural strength today to hold on. I'm believing God's going to remind you of the things he spoke in the water to know who you are. You are loved. You are his child. He is pleased with you. You are not the temptations that are coming against you. You are his child. And I believe God's going to give you the strength to hold on to that even in the wilderness. In fact, I want everybody, would you just bow your head and close your eyes? Just right where you are. If you're a man 
you be so honest to say today, hey, Pastor Robert, I'm, I'm in the wilderness and I know I cannot do this in my own strength. I need Jesus' help. I want you just right where you are just to lift up your hand. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just as a sign of surrender, say, God, I need you. Hey, you cannot do it in your own strength. There's nothing more powerful than a man saying, God, I give up, I surrender, I cannot do this. Just lift up your hand right where you are. You can put it right back down. Heads stay bowed, please, eyes stay closed. If you're listening to me as a man and you've never taken that first step, which is say, Jesus, my life is yours. Come on, make no doubt about it. We are all God's children in a sense by creation. Come on, every single person you meet has the image of God on them. That's why I am praying for this sickness and this sin of racism to be dismantled, especially in the church. We are all God's children. We are made in his image. But there's a difference between being a child of God by creation and a child of God by redemption. Have you done what the Bible says? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you haven't, I want to give you this moment. What a perfect day on Father's Day to say, I'm coming to my Father saying, I need you. Would you keep your head eyes closed? But if you never surrendered your life to Jesus, I just want you to lift up your hand right where you are and say, God, I am surrendering my life to you on this Father's Day. Just lift it up and put it right back down. If you lift up your hand for either one of those, I want to lead you in this prayer just before pastor comes. I want you to pray this prayer. Say, dear Jesus. In fact, let's all say it as one big family. Say, dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving me enough to pay the price for my sin. Jesus, I know I'm a great sinner, but I also know you're a great savior. So come into my life, make me brand new. From this moment forward, I am walking with you. All that I am is yours. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, if you pray that prayer, the Bible is clear that if any man, if any woman, if any teenager, if anybody be in Christ, you are a brand new creation, a brand new creature. And I want to thank you, the Gateway Church family, for allowing me to share the Word of God with you on this Father's Day. I cannot wait for these shelter-in-place orders and restrictions to be lifted so I can be there in the flesh with you. And hear your amen. Uh, but I'm so thankful to be able to share the Word of God with you today on this Father's Day. Please know that Robert Madu in Dallas, Texas, loves you, and I'm praying for you. God bless. I want you to stand here for those that are here and for those that are tuning in. I want to just encourage you that we want this word to become reality in our lives. And if you feel like you're in a wilderness season, know that the Spirit of God is with you. And I love that last point. Know where your help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so, Father, we just pray in this moment for each and every person that is struggling each and every one that's conflicted each one that's experiencing pain and I just pray peace and Lord I pray that a word that's been stored in our hearts would explode from within us in, this, in these seasons that we would know that we are yours. God, I pray for every single person that's tuning in, Lord, that you do a great and mighty work. Lord, we thank you for this. We give you the praise. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Just before we dismiss here, for those that are online, we want to connect with you. We want to see you face to face. And uh, right now, uh, we've got someone that's uh, jumping online and going to be on a Zoom call. We've been doing this over the last few weeks. We love it. We'd encourage you to jump on over to Zoom and uh, to know that we're going to be there. We want to pray with you. How can we be lifting you up? 
and uh, to do that. And then just last thing is the next week, come at 9 o'clock, come at 11 o'clock. Let's worship together. I know that uh, some of you will uh, feel comfortable to do that, and we are going to be open arms. We're going to say, hey, uh, join us. Uh, For those of you that are more sensitive and saying, you know what, I'm going to give it a week or two, we understand that as well, but continue to be faithful online. We thank you for that. Next week as well, we're going to be celebrating generosity and uh, celebrating uh, what God has been doing financially and we'll be sharing some of those things. You won't want to miss that. Uh, Without further ado, Lord, I just pray that you'd go before us, behind us, and all around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go in the grace of God here, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegateway.church.